Good morning. My name is Gennady Andrienko, and it's my pleasure to chair this session on Visual Analytics applications and workflows. You probably heard from the introduction that this year Eurovia is very selective. About one third of the submissions were rejected. So I'm really looking forward to see the accepted papers, and we have four very interesting papers in, in this session. So let's start with the first one. The paper is called Lessons Learned While Supporting Cyber Situation Awareness, and it will be presented by Graziana Blasili. Hi, I am Simone Lenti from Sapienza University of Rome. Together with Graziana Blasili and Sergio Picca, we will present our work on lessons learned while supporting cyber situational awareness. The context is the cyber defense of critical infrastructures. Critical infrastructures are systems and services of sectors like energy and healthcare, whose operational continuity is essential to guarantee the economic or social well-being of a country. In the last years, the increasing application of standard embedded platforms and commercial off-the-shelf software have contributed to lower the cost and improve the ease of use, but with the effect of increasing their exposition to computer network-based attacks. In this scenario, the presence of mission constraints regarding the operational continuity of the infrastructure limits the applicability of fully automated solution and requires that security operators design structured strategies to reduce the attack surface without compromising the operational level. I quickly present the history of our work. The first version of this work was developed during the European project Panoptesec. A user-centered design with the security managers of a large public Italian company for energy and water supply led to the design of the attack model and to the first release of the visual analytics solution called MET. In 2019, we started a collaboration with the security experts of a big company in the military domain that were interested in our solution. This process led to the identification of some limitations and issues in the application of our solution to their scenario to the elicitation of new requirements and toast to the release of a second version of MED that is the core of this presentation. We will now present a brief introduction about the activities supported by this solution, the underlying attack model and the first version of the ASRON Analytics solution, and then we will focus on the second phase of the design. The five functions defined by the NIST in the Framework for Cybersecurity describe the kind of activities that are performed by security operators in this scenario. Identify refers to the ability of developing a general understanding of the potential cybersecurity threats and related risk, while protect describes the activities to avoid or limit their occurrence. The last three functions refer to the handling of occurring cybersecurity events. Detect defines the activities required to timely discover an incident, while respond describes the ones required to contain them. Finally, recover refers to the capacity of quickly restore any capabilities impaired due to an incident. Thus, the first two functions describe proactive activities performed to improve the security level in anticipation of future attacks, while the last three are typically triggered by a security event that warns of a possible ongoing security incident. From the operator's point of view, the major difference between these two classes is given by the temporal constraints of reactive analysis that force them to take decisions in a short period of time. In general, to perform these activities, the security operator must achieve and maintain a situational awareness level that allows him to identify, understand and anticipate the evolving threats as part of the decision action cycle defined by Ansley for dynamic environments. In our context, we define the general goal of the operator as the continuous research of the best trade-off between the reduction of the attack surface and the impact on the organizational mission which may result after the application of the countermeasures, both for proactive and reactive analysis. We now briefly present the attack model underlying our solution. Devices of the network can be affected by weaknesses in software and hardware components that can be detected by tools such as vulnerability scanners. 
an attacker can exploit these vulnerabilities, given certain conditions about the exploitability of the vulnerability itself and the reachability of the device. Exploiting different vulnerabilities lead to different impacts on the device. A second element to keep into account is that some of these vulnerabilities allow the attacker to gain privileges on the device. By leveraging the privileges obtained on the device, the attacker can use a technique called pivoting that allows him to reach other devices that were previously unreachable. In this scenario, the threats are thus modeled as multi-step attacks, starting from a source and reaching a target, by exploiting a sequence of vulnerabilities on different devices. The consequences of a vulnerability exploit on the mission depends on the importance of the affected device. Given a path, we can define its likelihood as the probability that it is instantiated, given the reachability and exploitability conditions. The impact represents the consequences on the organizational mission based on the importance of the targeted devices. It is now possible to associate a risk level to the path that is roughly equivalent to the product of its likelihood and its impact. MED is a visual analytic solution that uses this model to support the first four cybersecurity functions. The proactive environment of MED supports the analysis of the multi-step attacks and evaluation of the countermeasures to contain them. Conversely, the reactive environment supports the detection of ongoing attacks and their mitigation. MBDA is a multinational company with almost 10,000 employees in Europe and USA. This company is a world leader in the military missile system domain. In 2019, we started a collaboration with cybersecurity experts of MBDA company. The company is interested in our solution since they are involved in the research and application of dual-use technologies technologies that can be used in both civilian and military context. This collaboration was focused on the identification of some limitations and issues in the application of our solution in this scenario, and to the elicitation of new requirements that led to the release of a second version of the prototype that we call MED version 2. The MBDA company, after having anonymized real data for security reasons, provided us with a pseudo-real network, which represents a common MPDA military scenario. The network is composed of 242 devices and 62 subnetworks. It shows a nine average number of vulnerabilities and dense topological connections. The built-in attack graph generator of MET generates almost a million of possible attack paths in this particular scenario. This cardinality causes in MET version 1 both computational and visual issues. Let's have now a quick tour of MET version 1 applied in this scenario. This is the proactive environment of MET version 1. On the left, there is the network view in which the attack graph is superimposed of the network topology. Green, blue and red colors represent attack path steps. In green, we have the source device of the attack and the first steps of the attack paths. In blue, all the middle steps and in red, the final steps. On the right, a parallel coordinates plot allows to inspect and filter attack paths by several attributes. In this example, by considering just one source, there exists almost 6,000 attack paths that allow to reach half of the network devices. When we start to consider multiple sources, attack paths can be up to a million, generating high computational visual issues. Supported by two cybersecurity experts of MPTA company, we identified four main requirements to address in order to mitigate the issues of MET and better support cyber situation awareness. Threats impact is an important aspect to consider to improve situation awareness of cybersecurity experts. 
Therefore, we included additional information in method 2. In particular, we added information about vulnerabilities exploit consequences regarding confidentiality, integrity, availability impacts, and privilege escalation. With the term privilege escalation, we mean an exploit that allows to gain privileges on the system, like uh, become user or root of the machine. The goal of this requirement is to differentiate information between proactive and reactive analysis, to provide the operators with all the necessary information and to avoid overwhelming them. Concerning proactive analysis, we define new encodings to represent the new information about privilege escalation and vulnerability exploit. First of all, we decide to change colors since green, blue and red are not good in expressing risk information. So, we switch to more common colors for cybersecurity operators. This is a device of the network. In MET1, is represented on the proportion of attack paths crossing the device. In MET2, from a pie chart, we switch to a nested data chart. The internal ring represents the attack path proportion. The external ring of the data chart represents the number of exploited vulnerabilities and the number of them that allows an internal escalation. The background of the node represents the higher privilege reached by the attacker among known user and root. This is the new proactive environment of MET2. We are watching a single source attack graph that involves 18 devices with more than 20,000 distinct attack paths. Even if we are considering a single source, we have a big number of attack paths. This big number comes from the dense topological connection and the high number of vulnerabilities on devices. The size of the nodes and edges depend on how many attack paths traverse them. We can quickly identify the source through the yellow color. Most of the nodes have a blue background, meaning that the attacker can reach user privileges on them. Two nodes have a no background, meaning that the user can only reach known privileges on them. One device instead has a red background, meaning that the attacker can become root of this machine. Concerning reactive analysis, experts pointed out the need of showing detailed impact on CIA levels for devices and an overall level of how much it has been compromised. This is the reactive environment of MET2. We have two yet compromised devices and the possible next steps that the attacker can follow. MET is listening to the intrusive detection system for alerts about network anomalies and compromised nodes. When alerts arrive, MET combines this information with the attack graph and shows compromised nodes along with the possible next step of the attack. The visualization updates showing the current state of the attack. Thanks to this environment, the security operator is able to follow the attack and apply possible countermeasures. The new encoding defined for satisfying requirement 1 introduced cluttering and render issues. Standard anti-clutter solution like sampling cannot be used. Each attack path is important and the security operator must be aware of it. So, we decide to apply clustering on device using together geography, topology and business information. C1, C2, 3 and 4 are clusters of devices involved in the data graph. The encoding is the same for cluster and nodes. In this example, a drill down must be done on cluster 2 and its devices are visible, while other clusters show attack information only at cluster level. This type of aggregation has been appreciated by the experts because it allows to quickly identify the dangerous areas of the network in which the operator should focus first. Security operators use their knowledge of resources, cost and bidding constraints to steer the process of identifying and simulating mitigation strategies using a motif analysis. MET version 2 starts from the Vulnus mitigation strategy, which is based on the unweighted set cover algorithm.
and generates an order list of vulnerabilities to fix by prioritizing them according to the cardinality of the parts involved. We improved the original strategy by considering the role that devices play in the business continuity and prioritizing the fix according to that. In addition, we have the possibility to perform a what-if analysis of medication on the visualization, quickly showing the effect of their application. The last requirement is to show geography information along with the topology, since cybersecurity operators can better be confident with the network. In order to minimize differences between topology and geography, we decide to show geography information only for clusters. A cluster is located on the coordinates of its centroid. When a cluster has expanded to see its devices, they are located around the centroid, while a convex hull hides the map, meaning that the geography is not representative anymore for this part of the network. This is a summary of lesson learned during our search. The choice of colors and icons should be considered habits and best practices of the domain in which we are working. It is important to provide operators with all the necessary information to be aware of what happened, but it is also important to avoid overwhelming them, so information should be differentiated according to the task that is currently supported. Since sampling cannot be in general used in cybersecurity domain, an approach that considers semantic aggregation of information can be useful and can mitigate possible scalability issues. What if analysis helps operators to perform their workflow since allow to quickly understand the effect of user choices, like for example while testing mitigation strategies. MED is a visual analytic system for managing proactive and reactive analysis of cyber attacks over a large network. Two years ago, we started our research with cybersecurity expert of a world leader military company. The aim of our research was to discover and mitigate the system issues in order to improve the cyber situational awareness. In our paper, we present the lessons that we learned during this journey. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your talk. It's a very interesting work. Uh, there are no questions in the chat so far, therefore I will start with my own questions. Fortunately, uh, as a session chair, I had the possibility to read your paper in advance. And, uh, I appreciate that it's really very interesting work and uh, I have some comments. As, I, as far as I understand from your paper, you dealt with simulated data, not with real data. Is this correct? Yes. Yeah. Did you have a chance to look at real data uh, of similar kind? No, since uh, so we, we were working with a cybersecurity company and in the military domain, so they didn't provide us the real data for privacy. Mm -hmm. So they provide um, a pseudo real network that can uh, simulate the real one. But my experience uh, is that uh, even if uh, uh, simulated data are simulated very, very carefully, it is it happens very often that uh, uh, they do not hold the same properties and features as real data. Did you uh, consider possibilities that real data, imaginably uh, real data that may come one day into your system, uh, have some imperfections? Uh, yeah, in this case, you probably need to, to be able to identify what is not perfect in the data, what is wrong, and how to deal with this. Now, what we we think is, is that um, so a real network can be um, a little bit simple than the network that uh, the company provides us. Since uh, so the the cell network uh, has a lot of vulnerabilities, and then we suppose that real network. Uh, um, can be less affected by vulnerabilities. So we, we are uh, in the worst scenario. I think in, with a real network, we, the system will perform better. Yeah. 
innovation is what in real data sets very often it happens but some important parts of the data are missing other are noisy in some uh, components others are uh, coming in too much uh, quantities what is not expected uh, to be so it is always useful to look into distributions and uh, check if uh, you observe some uh, non-expected dis uh, distribution uh, of uh, data frequency and data properties yes but uh, we, we cannot do it yeah uh, i understand it it's a usual problem when you deal with simulated data and have no access to real data there is also a question in which chat from uh, 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 somebody very anonymous uh, and probably simulated which unique requirements of critical infrastructures as opposed to traditional networks is the solution tailored to so what is specific about your uh, critical infrastructure so what is this uh, the system is applied uh, on a particular network with a high number of um, vulnerabilities and uh, so a high number of possible attacks. Uh, the problem is that uh, common tool dealing with a, a huge number of uh, vulnerabilities and attacks in general I use uh, um, simple visualization like matrix or uh, tables. So. The, our solution has to, to manage a huge number of uh, attack paths and uh, allow to the, the security operator to be aware of uh, every single attack path and uh, from the risk posed to the network. Okay, thank you. Now we have a series of questions from Jason Dykes from City University in London. I wonder if uh, after Brexit we are allowed to, at Eurovis conference to give a floor to UK uh, scientists to ask questions, but anyway. So first question. So what are the best places to get and share simulated data of this type? Sorry. I... Uh, what are the best places to get and share simulated data of this type? Uh, so this is uh, what the companies, I don't know if we can share and use all the data. Okay, when the second question also from Jason, do any of the vast challenge data sets work and would they allow you to test the system on uh, other data sets? No, we we start uh, by working with uh, our energy supply company and with their first solution of the system, and uh, so in, in civilian context, and then move on military context. We did not use uh, past challenge data, but uh, yes, we can do. We can try to 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 use the data. Yeah, what I would expect from Jason Dykes is to ask something about geographical component of your data. But as he is not asking this, let me ask my, myself. Uh, I noticed that uh, uh, you also allow positioning nodes of a network in geographical space. But uh, what may happen with uh, uh, geographical space in such applications is that you have very high density of nodes in some areas, like in big cities, and very low density in uh, other areas, like in oceans, in, uh, in the woods, and so on. And uh, probably just a plain map is not uh, a perfect solution in this case, and uh, you may need to have some instrument to deal with multiple scales of geographical space. Did you think about these ideas? No. Uh, so we try to use clustering to reduce uh, problem of density. So uh, it is possible that a cluster has a lot of device and uh, in a dense uh, location, since we use uh, the information under the clustering algorithm. And uh, we try, so we, we think that this solution can help to, to avoid dance zone and uh, less dense one. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's time to finish with the first paper and go on to the second one. Thanks again. Congratulations for your very interesting work.
Hello again, it's again me, Gennady Andrienko, and now we are on the paper number two, Customizable Coordination of Independent Visual Analytics Tools, and this is a joint work between University of Rostock in Germany and Aarhus, uh, Aarhus University in Denmark. The floor is yours. Hello, everybody. My name is Lars Nonnemann. And my name is Maurice Ogrefer. Welcome to our talk on customizable coordination of independent visual analytics tools, which is based on collaborative research between the University of Rostock, Aarhus University, and Fraunhofer Institute for Computer Graphics Research, Rostock. As shared authors, Marius and I will present you our collaborative work in two parts. First, I will present the background and contribution of our paper. Second, Marius will showcase our implementation in Anyproc and explain its use in our self-assigned use case. And with that in mind, let's have a look at our paper. When we look at the field of visual analytics, we realize that there are many available tools for solving domain-dependent tasks, reaching from libraries to extensible frameworks. Yet, as no tool is best suited for every task, they are often used in a chained manner by utilizing specific functionalities in each analysis step from cleaning, pre-processing and visual interactive analysis to fine-tuning the visual results. Therefore, one has to either implement a new system that integrates all the needed functionality or run each VA tool separately during the analysis. Both of these approaches have their pros and cons. Implementing a new powerful framework like NIME or Tableau with integrative ideas can result in an inconceivable development overload due to missing compatibilities in the supported API or software infrastructure. However, running individual to VA tools separately can get easily tedious and limiting as switching between VA tools breaks the analytic flow by having to worry about technical constraints like data export and import between tools. Something simple, like going back to a previous step in the analysis to readjust a parameter or observe its effects in the subsequent visualization becomes a much more painful experience if one needs to do this back and forth between various tools. Our approach does neither revolve around the implementation of a new powerful VA framework nor the usage of VA tools separately, but is rather based on a lightweight coordination model. This model follows a few constraints to facilitate the challenge on a generalistic data exchange between independent VA tools. Firstly, it's opportunistic by using any available data channel, allowing us to mix and match tools from different software ecosystems, such as native applications using the file system or web apps using server-based mechanisms. Secondly, it's minimalistic by propagating data exchange along the analytic workflow between subsequent or concurrently used VA tools instead of broadcasting data updates to all tools. Thirdly, it utilizes VA tools as atomic components so that we do not have to observe the individual states of each tool but merely the switches between tools to catch their output and feed it into the next one. Our previously established approach for tool coordination breaks tool chains down in three layers. The usage flow captures which tools are intended to be used and in which order to start and stop the respective VA tool. The data flow specifies how the exchange of data between each pair of VA tools is performed. The control flow captures the moment of the actual transition between tools to have a clear indicator when to switch and thus when to exchange data between VA tools. This conceptual idea is implemented in our new analytical process constructor called Anyproc. It is difficult to predefine the usage flow as this part is influenced by user preferences and domain dependent tasks. Hence Anyproc exhibits the usage flow directly to the user through a visual editor. This editor allows users to include and link VA tools from a repository of available tools to create a respective execution order. 
It explicitly provides the possibility to include one VA tool multiple times in a tool chain for a repeated use as well as to place multiple tools at the same time for their concurrent use. In order to determine the technical realization of which data is passed in which way between subsequent and concurrently used VA tools, AnyProc allows further configuration of data exchange. Thereby different channels can be selected to either tunnel the data through the native file system or a web server such as Revise. In order to describe how often and how long invocations of VA tools are used, AnyProc provides a small persistent screen widget called Executor. This window gives ready access to the tool chain and the underlying syncing of the data between VA tools by featuring buttons to start the next tool as well as to restart the previous VA tool. When using these buttons, the predefined data flow will be carried out according to the configured setting within the visual editor. All that being said, we will now present you the usage of set components in a video presentation for the customization of an example tool chain. In this video, we demonstrate how the analytical process constructor AnyProc facilitates visual analysis across multiple tools and several tables from the critical care dataset MIMIC3, as described in our paper. AnyProc automates the data exchange between independent visual analytics tools across any available channel between two tools. In front of us, we see the toolchain editor of AnyProc. At the top of this editor, we can import our analytics tools, and at the bottom, we can import datasets. All imports are done through drag and drop from the File Explorer. In the middle of the interface, we can then combine all tools and datasets to specify the usage flow of our toolchain. We now import three visual analytics tools by dragging them into the top part, and then we arrange them into a toolchain. In this case, we will use the constants information minor 9 with which we can analyze the dataset without writing any code, the visual exploration tool VisFlow, and then finally Color Brewer, which will help us to find appropriate color schemes for our data. All three tools have a particular purpose in the visual analysis process, and each of them has its own strengths when it comes to analyzing data. By using them in combination with each other, we can also alleviate the shortcomings each tool comes with. NIME, for example, excels at constructing powerful analysis pipelines, yet it lacks flexibility when it comes to exploring the data. That's what VisFlow, in turn, is great at, which allows us to interactively explore the data across visualizations. VisFlow, however, is very limited in terms of color encodings we can choose. And this is the focus, in turn, of ColorBrew. No tool on its own can give us this flexibility that we get by using these tools in a toolchain. If you wanted to use this toolchain without any proc, that would require some serious efforts on our sides. For instance, we would have to manually import and export the data into the correct file formats, and every single time we wanted to switch tools, we would have to do that manually. This is where any proc comes in and takes care of this data exchange for us. We specify in the editor which tools we want to use in what order and how the data can be exchanged between them. And then we can focus on our analysis while AnyProc handles this exchange. So we begin specifying the tool chain by dragging the tools from the top part into the graph section of the editor. Then we specify the data flow by first importing four data tables from the MIMIC3 dataset as CSV files by dragging them into the bottom part of the interface. And then we specify that they should be imported by NIME by placing them onto the icon of NIME in the toolchain. Since NIME does not allow opening CSV files per se, we specify a custom connector. We also specify the data flow between tools by clicking on the plus symbol between them. Here, we use the default option. When we switch between two tools in this tool chain, we want them to automatically send their data through a revise server. This server is started together with AnyProc and uses WebSockets to receive and forward Megalite specifications to visual analytics tools. As a side note, the code to all components used in this video is available through the links in our paper and at the end of this presentation. So at this point, 
we have configured the usage flow and data flow of our toolchain. In the editor, we can see what tools are accessing what data in what order and how they exchange that data. To configure the control flow, we open the executor panel of Anyproc, which you can now see popping up in the bottom right corner of the screen. Using this panel, we can jump between the steps of the tool chain we have just configured using the buttons on the left and on the right. We will now begin our analysis by clicking on the arrow to the right, which launches NIME, the first tool in our tool chain, and imports the datasets we configured in the editor. After NIME has launched, we select the workflow that was created for us, which contains nodes that import the four CSV files. It also contains nodes that handle the data exchange with a revised server. And now we can begin our analysis as described in our paper. The great thing about NIME is that we do not have to write any code, but we can just use the nodes that the tool gives us. At the end of our analysis, we connect the end of our workflow with a web view, which renders the results in a Vega Lite plot. We can see that our workflow has found two clusters, the blue cluster 0 on the left and the orange cluster 1 on the right. Specifying this analysis in NIME was rather simple, but it is rather challenging in NIME to interactively explore these clusters that we've just discovered. But since we're using a tool chain, we can just go ahead and open this visualization that we see here in another tool that excels at visual exploration. In our tool chain, that next tool is Visflow, which we can simply open using any proc by clicking the arrow on the right again. This opens up Visflow in the browser, showing us the visualization we saw before in Nine. We can now go ahead and analyze the data in Visflow, for instance, using parallel coordinates, but we can also go ahead and open the next tool in the tool chain, which is Calibrua to analyze it there. In any proc, all we need to do for this is use the control panel. But for now, let's go back to this flow. So in our parallel coordinate plot, we can see that one of the two clusters contains patients with an age of over 300 years. And that seems to be an obvious mistake in the data. This flow does not allow us to adjust the computation, but we can just go back into nine and make these changes there. After we corrected our NIME workflow, we see that the visualization now only shows one cluster. We will now explore that cluster back in VisFlow. We want to analyze the relationship between the fluid intake and output per patient and admission of their stay at the intensive care unit. To visualize these distributions and the scatterplot of our project data, we would like to use an appropriate color scale but VisFlow is very limited in the options it provides us here. Since we want flexibility, we just load the data to Colorbrewer next. Here, we can choose between the wide catalog of options and choose the one that suits our needs. Again, looking at the data back in this flow, it now becomes clear that there exists large differences in fluid intake and output for some patients which seem implausible. We could again remove these patients from our analysis by making more adjustments in NIME, yet this no longer seems like a viable solution because cleaning the data manually is too demanding that way. Since we're using a tool chain, we can instead add another tool to our tool chain that excels at data cleaning. One example of this is OpenRefine. To extend the tool chain, we open any prox tool chain editor again and import OpenRefine through drag and drop from our file explorer. Then we move it to the head of the toolchain and adjust the data connection to nine. Afterwards, we move the data sources from nine to OpenRefine. And now finally, we can reset the control flow of the toolchain. And with that, we would like to end the video here. We have demonstrated how Anyproc supports us in using multiple specialized analysis tools in combination with each other in a tool chain by automating the data exchange between tools. We also demonstrated how this allows us to easily switch between tools during the analysis rather than manually handling the import and export of data every time we switch tools. Lastly, we showed how we can extend and modify the tool chain with another specialized analysis tool once it became necessary 
during the scenario. The presented implementation gives a first impression of what VA tool coordination as a concept can do for us. Our concept is realized through the analytical process construct of Anyproc that can be seen as a technical foundation for independent VA tool coordination. The application provides the user with a visual interface for the configuration and execution of predefined tool chains and supports the automatic data exchange based on customized characteristics. However, there are still many open questions for future research that need to be addressed. This includes the handling of different data formats, capturing different aspects of the data, its analysis and visualization potentially in ambiguous ways. Furthermore, it is necessary to facilitate a concise visual overview on the progression within the toolchain in order to illustrate impending or reoccurring analysis steps to the user. Thank you for your attention. If you are interested in our research, please have a look at our links. Hello, thank you, thank you very much for your presentation. Your work is really, really impressive. And this is not only my opinion, but I also see a comment from, I don't know if you know him in person, Christian Taminski from University of Rostock. He is also very impressed and he asks a couple of questions. Specifically, what are the requirements to make visual analytics tools compatible with the approach? And did you have to change anything in Color Brewer specifically to make it work in, uh, inside uh, your workflow tool? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, so in order to make tools join our tool chain, we need some kind of way of getting data in and out of there. And um, what we would use generally is something that allows us to import and export CSV files in, in the basic sense. In Color Brewer in particular, what we did, uh, what you saw in the video was we made it such that we can import um, bigger light specifications. Um, and we did that by basically taking the Color Brewer code that's open source and then extended the functionality by importing the revised library, which then gives us the opportunity to um, connect to this revised server that was mentioned in the video that receives and can send bigger light specifications. Um, so what we needed to do was add the adapter basically to the revised interface and then the ability to render um, bigger light specifications in, um, uh, in Color Brewer. So uh, it's not that we just plugged in Color Brewer and then everything works, but we actually had to make active adjustments to these tools so, so that it, wor it works in the way that you saw in the video. Uh, looking at this approach more, in more general way, I understand that basically you exchange data tables between uh, multiple systems. This allows you uh, a lot of flexibility, but on, on the other hand, this means that you can uh, connect only those tools that deal with data tables. And if you need to deal with something more complex like, uh, uh, say, graphs uh, or images uh, or text, you probably need to do some pre-processing uh, again. Uh, yes. So um, to correct a bit on, on that question, we are exchanging Vega Light specifications. So that's JSON objects, um, JSON files, basically, that contain the data and that contain the whole visualization pipeline that gives us the description of how data is uh, mapped to um, uh, the, the yeah, tabular data that uh, was used in the analysis. So this, in theory, uh, you could basically exchange these Vega Light descriptions. If they support graphs, then in theory, you would be able to also exchange graph data across, across tools that support this. Um, but yeah, we are currently limited in, in the sense that um, tabular data is what, what is supported. Okay, let me ask you another question, uh, also in continuation to the previous one. Imagine that some columns uh, or multiple columns in your data set contain time-related information. You in Rostock uh, uh, are very strong in analysis of temporal data, but uh, what is special about time is that uh, you can having a single daytime component, you can get multiple variables out of it, like day of the week, time of the day, and many, many others. Uh, 
this creates an enormous possibilities for future fiber analysis in, in external systems. But I can't imagine how you can uh, automate the process of such analysis in your workflow. Do you have any idea of how to deal with time data? Um, yes, um, maybe I can answer that. Um, as we showed, this is uh, just the first example. And of course, we had uh, these uh, connection options that we customly uh, entered there. But what we imagine is that the uh, data scientist um, has, it, has its own tools how to read out information from an uncertain data set. And we want to uh, basically uh, have the editor with the options to include these uh, conversion tools or connectors. So uh, we didn't uh, specify uh, a lot of uh, parts for the uh, data as we uh, didn't know which part of the data will be used because we want to make it as open as possible, even though, of course, we have uh, limitations in that case. Yeah. Okay. If you don't want to say specific about time, probably I will not ask you about geographical space as well. In this case, because geographical space is another enormous domain that requires a lot of attention and a lot of flexibility and complexity handling. But returning back to basic traditional flat tables, another thing that may be useful to add to your implementation is a kind of validation of data properties or data quality. Like uh, in your example, you found in the analysis that a group of patients uh, have aged over 100 years and the more, maybe you could add uh, some tools that will automatically check what are the properties of the data that are coming from one system to another, what are uh, expectations and what could be unexpected and how to uh, alarm a user about that or suggest him what to do. Did you think about uh, these ideas? Yeah, that sounds like a really great extension of our approach. Um, um, like the, the connection notes that you saw be that we put between tools up basically flexible in what kind of logic we implement there. So what you suggested is it could be something that um, if, <laughs> in the future we could add to these connections so that data is automatically uh, cleaned by it basically. But the way that we designed um, any proc was that it's more or less unopinionated on what is what data is exchanged. So we allow for um, faulty or uh, messy data basically. Um, what you saw in the in the in the use case video, in the end, was that we added uh, a specific tool to the top of the tool chain that was uh, basically excelling at at data cleaning for us, um, so that we can have this unopinionated tool chain and then add our the tools that we need, for example, for data cleaning when we need it. Um, mm -hmm. That was the idea here, but uh, the suggestion you made is definitely something that could also be um, considered. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as we don't have further questions, I think we will now stop. Thanks again for your presentation and very interesting discussion. I'm looking forward to see a longer full paper uh, about your work in the future. And now let's go to the third presentation in the session. Now we go to paper number three in this se uh, session with very short uh, title, but very interesting content, a taxonomy of attribute scoring functions by Jenny Schmidt, Schmidt and Jürgen Bernard from, from University of Zurich. So the floor is yours. Welcome to our presentation, a taxonomy of attribute scoring functions. My name is Jenny Schmidt, and I will guide you through this presentation. Let's start with the question, why are attribute scoring functions needed and what is their benefit? 
Most of you have been in a situation where you had to make a decision between several items all having multiple attributes. Such multi-attribute decisions on an item level can be hard as it is not always easy to compare different multi-attribute items to each other. We believe that a shift from the item granularity to the attribute granularity could be a promising approach and make such decisions easier as users often have preferences for certain attributes that can be used for decision making. In addition, using such attribute preferences can also support a large user group in decision making since also non-experts have preferences. Let me present you an example that illustrates this scenario. Imagine an average woman, we call her Mary, that wants to buy a used car. Mary knows what she prefers in a car. Her ideal car would be as cheap as possible, as fast as possible, neither too old nor too new since old cars have high maintenance costs and new cars cost in general more. Her ideal car should be black or silver or at least blue since she doesn't like other colors and it should have as few exhausts as possible since high emissions are taxed exponentially. The standard approach of looking for a car would be the following. Mary would go to a website that sells used cars and apply some filters such as a maximum price or a preferred color. Already here we see that Mary can only use cutoff criteria instead of preferences, which means that she can only tell the system what she doesn't want but not what she prefers. Based on the filter criteria, the system then returns a list of cars that match these criteria, in our case roughly 5000 ads are found. All cars are shown in a result list with a brief description of the car and maybe some key data. The problem here is that every car has the same score and the list does not show the best matching car on top of the list. Of course, Mary can also use some sorting on this list, for example she can sort the cars based on the price, but she can only use one sort criteria at a time. With this sorted list, it is still hard for Mary to find the perfect car. Another approach could be to use ranking with, for example, the tool lineup. With lineup, Mary can create attribute scorings for the attributes where she knows her preferences and lineup then aligns the cars according to Mary's preferences showing the best matching car at the top. This means Mary needs to construct an attribute scoring for each of the five attributes. These attribute scorings then transform the input values into some sort of output value, which we call scores. We illustrate here examples of such functions. For the first criteria, that the car should be as cheap as possible, an attribute scoring could look like this. We see that the cheapest prices get the highest scores, here is score of 1, and the score decreases while the prices increase. Somewhere there is a maximum value that Mary does not want to exceed when buying a new car, therefore the function assigns a score of 0 after the threshold is reached. The next criteria, that Mary wants the car to be as fast as possible, can be represented by a linear function that gives the highest scores to cars that have the highest maximal speed. The third criteria, concerning the age of the car, could result in a roof function, assigning the highest score to middle-aged cars and lower scores to very old or very new cars. Mary also prefers black and silver cars and doesn't mind blue cars. Here we have a categorical value and need to assign scores to different categories, namely the car colors. We can represent Mary's preferences by assigning high values to black and silver cars, medium values to blue cars and low values to any other color such as red. Lastly, Mary wants her car to have as few exhausts as possible, but since high exhausts are penalized exponentially by the government, we also want to represent this in a function and can therefore use a flipped logarithmic function for this preference. Now we have an idea of what the attribute scoring could look for like for Mary. Apart from multi-attribute rankings, we can also use attribute scorings for multi-criteria optimization, where optimization algorithms are used that find compromise solutions that try to optimize more than one criteria at the same time. Usually, there does not exist a single best solution, but rather many Pareto optimal solutions where a user can then choose one of them. The tool PAVED, for example, offers a visualization for such Pareto fronts. Another analysis goal is similarity modeling in information retrieval, where distance metrics are applied either on individual attributes or the entire attribute set. 
the result of distance metrics form one-dimensional matrix spaces and serve as the input for scoring functions, which can then transform the distances into similarities. For multi-attribute ranking, there exists a pioneering approach, namely the tool Lineup, that we've already seen. Lineup offers different types of attribute scorings for transforming input values into output scores and it offers different tools for the interactive creation of such functions. It has a graphical user interface where users can create attribute scorings interactively and a scripting engine where users can create attribute scorings programmatically. Lineup already offers support for some types of attribute scorings and attributes, but it does not cover the whole range of attribute scorings. This leads us to the motivation of our work. Five factors for motivating this work. First, it may make sense to distinguish between the study of attribute scoring functions and tools enabling users to create different types of attribute scoring functions. Second, we identified that both attribute scoring functions and attribute scoring function creation tools have not yet been investigated and described systematically. Third, research on the creation of attribute scoring functions in math and VA seems to coexist independently from each other leaving room for the study of combinations and synergies. Fourth, surprisingly little support exists for the interactive creation of attribute scoring functions. For some types of attribute scoring functions, VA support is entirely missing. Finally, in several real-world use cases, we identified the unsatisfied need of non-experts for the interactive creation of attribute scoring functions, which additionally calls for future VA support. Our contribution consists of a hierarchical taxonomy of attribute scoring functions, an overview of tools for the creation of attribute scoring functions, and a discussion that explains the relationship between attribute scoring functions and VA workflows. Now we would like to discuss the attribute scoring functions further and explain them in detail. We have three characteristics that describe attribute scoring functions. From now on, we call them ASFs. First, ASFs always transform attribute input values into numerical scores for the entire input value domain. Second, the value domain of output scores has a polarity and is either unipolar or bipolar. And lastly, output scores carry valence information, such as high values are good. Through these characteristics, ASFs can carry information about user preferences. Here, we show you a mock-up for the interactive creation of ASFs, which will help you later in understanding the taxonomy of ASFs. You can see the input values on the bottom and the output scores on the right, here in a bipolar range. The orange line represents the scoring function that was created interactively by the user. The shown ASF here could, for example, show the exponential preference for maximum speed in cars. We see how low speed values are transformed into low output scores around minus one, and high speed values are transformed into high output scores around plus one. For creating our taxonomy, we conducted an extensive literature research. We had two targets for this research. On one hand, we looked for ASFs that we could then use for the creation of our taxonomy, which we'll present next. On the other hand, we looked for ASF creation tools that were used to identify gaps in VA support, which we will present later. We now present to you our taxonomy of ASFs. We briefly describe every type of ASF, and for every type, we also noted which tool already supports this type. Overall, we found eight different types of ASFs, as can be seen in this table. On the first level of the taxonomy, we differentiate between ASFs for categorical and numerical attributes, since the found ASFs differ fundamentally for those two attribute types. For the categorical ASFs, we first have the score assignment. For this type of ASF, a user assigns scores directly to every category and the input values are transformed into output scores according to this score assignment. In our car example, this ASF could be used when a user assigns scores to different car models and cannot compare these models to each other. Next, we have two types of ASF that we call ordered. The first one is an ordered equidistant ASF, where the user orders all categories and the distances between categories are equally sized. This could, for example, be used for car colors, where a user can tell which color she prefers but not how much he prefers a color over another. It already exists a VA support for this ASF by the tool Podium. 
The next ASF type is ordered and non-equidistant. Here again, the user creates an order of all categories, but the distances are not equally sized. This ASF could be used for car brands, where a user can tell the, which brand she prefers and also how much she prefers a brand over another. Next up are numerical ASFs. We differentiate between two-point, multipoint and quantile-based ASFs. For two-point ASFs, we have linear and non-linear. Both ASFs have two points, as the name already says, and a line segment between them. In the two-point linear ASF, this segment is linear and could, for example, be used for expressing the preferences for fast cars. A mathematical example of such a function is a min-max normalization. VA support exists by the tools lineup and paved. For the nonlinear ASF, the line segment is nonlinear and this ASF can, for example, be used for finding cars that are as cheap as possible where an increase in price results in an outsized decrease in score. VA support exists partially by the tool lineup. On the other hand, we have multipoint ASFs that have more than two points and the line segments between them are either continuous or discontinuous. Multipoint continuous ASFs, for example, can be used for finding cars that are neither too old nor too new, where we have such a roof-like function. A mathematical example could be the absolute value function. And again, partial support exists by the tool lineup. Multipoint discontinuous ASFs have line segments that are not always connected, such as, for example, in a mathematical step function. Here, it is important to notice that the ASF must still transform the whole input value domain and cannot have any holes in it. In our car example, this function could be used for finding a car that has an engine size below a certain threshold. The reason for this is that cars are taxed based on some threshold values in engine size, meaning for cars with an engine size of 1800 and 1900 cubic centimeters, you have to pay the same amount of tax, but for a car with an engine size of 2000 cubic centimeters, the tax is higher. Lastly, we have quantile-based ASFs that work based on statistical quantile normalization. In quantile normalization, the input values are ordered and the score is assigned to an input value based on its rank in this ordering. Quantile-based ASFs can be used for attributes without layers. In our literature research, we also looked for tools that already exist and can be used for the creation of ASFs. We found three different types of tools. First, we found tools that support users with programming experience in expressing their preferences mathematically. They are denoted with an M later in the overview. Second, inspiring VA approaches where users can define attribute transformations interactively but that are not used as an ASF, denoted by a V. Here, we also include the class of medical transfer functions that contain an interactive VA component. Transfer functions are used for volume rendering of medical data, such as MRI data. They must be adapted for every visualization, which can be difficult. Therefore, there exists work that supports users in the interactive creation of transfer function design. On the right, you can see an example of such an interactive interface for the creation of transfer functions from the paper High Dynamic Range Volume Visualization. Since transfer functions do not fulfill our three characteristics of ASFs, they are listed in this category here. Lastly, we have found tools that contain a VA component and support users to create ASFs interactively, denoted by an X. For every type of ASF from our taxonomy, we noted which tool supports it, as can be seen here in the table. You can see that there exists only a few tools that offer VA support for the interactive ASF creation for some types of ASF. Examples are Lineup and Paved. There exists a larger group of tools that have interactive VA support but do not create ASFs. And lastly, we have an even bigger group of tools that can be used for expressing preferences programmatically. Overall, most of the tools can only be used for either categorical or numerical attributes and there are only a few tools that support the interactive creation of ASFs. As the last contribution of our work, we explain the connection between ASFs and VA workflows. Attribute scoring is only one crucial step in the whole process, for example in multi-attribute decision making. A precondition for attribute scoring is that the attributes are in a useful form as could be done by preprocessing. 
After the attribute scoring, additional steps are needed such as the interactive weighting of attributes and the combination of different attribute scores to receive a summary score that can then be used, for example, for decision making. In the motivating example, we have seen that filtering was the standard approach for Mary to find a new car, although it had several limitations. We would like to explain the difference between ASFs and filters further. The first characteristic of ASFs is that they transform attribute values into numerical scores. Filters cannot do that since they exclude items from the collection, which is a much stronger operation than assigning low scores as with ASFs. Second, the output scores of ASFs have a polarity. This is not supported by filters since filters do not support preferences at all. And lastly, the output scores of ASFs have a valence. Again, this is not supported by filters since they do not support preferences. Therefore, we believe that filters are very different from ASFs. The interactive weighting and combining of scores could be one possible area of future work. Other possible areas are the design of visual interfaces for all types of ASFs, the application of ASFs for different analysis goals, the creation and design of multi-attribute scoring functions where multiple attribute values are combined and transformed into a single score, and the study of commonalities and differences between ASFs and filtering. To conclude this presentation, we'd like to summarize our contribution once again. First, we presented a hierarchical taxonomy of ASFs. Second, we showed an overview of tools that enabled creation of ASFs. Lastly, we discussed the integration of ASFs in VI workflows. We see the benefit of ASFs in that they can be offered to a larger group of users, making the achievement of downstream goals, such as multi-attribute decision-making, easier. For the last slide, we now have a statement that we would like to discuss with you later in the discussion. We claim that, in real-world applications, 99% of today's attribute scorings are not yet created with interactive visual support and not directly by the end users. You are interested in hearing your opinion on this statement and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. This is very nice and very interesting work and an excellent presentation, very clear and very uh, comprehensive. Uh, the topic of this paper is very close to my heart because when some time ago I was a computer science student, I studied multi-criteria decision analysis. So it's uh, very close to what I dreamed to uh, develop at uh, that time. And now listening to your talk, uh, I all, uh, all the time uh, I was comparing uh, what I would expect from uh, a perfect multi-criteria decision analysis tool and what I could get from uh, uh, your taxonomy of attribute scoring function. And I understand, uh, I realized that what I'm missing is the possibility to compare impact of multiple attribute scoring functions. I have some attribute that is interesting for me. I can imagine how I convert it into a decision criterion. I can do it in multiple ways depending on my mood or depending on uh, uh, some objective uh, things, but I don't know what would happen if I change from one uh, ASF, uh, ASF to another ASF. Do you think about mm -hmm. somehow supporting uh, such comparison? Yes, we do. So um, this whole thing with the attribute scoring functions and the taxonomy is just the starting of my work. And I'm at the moment implementing a tool that supports all of these scoring functions. And this tool also shows the output of the scoring functions. So these scoring functions are interactive. And as soon as you change something in the function itself, you see the result in the output. So you see directly what changes and, how, and also how this impacts the overall ranking in the end. Yeah, but just see what changes is not always a perfect solution because you, you, when you see some, something changed, you don't remember already what was a step uh, before, step earlier. And therefore, it, it might be very useful to have a possibility to uh, put uh, side, side by side two or multiple variants of ASF and compare uh, what is the impact of one or another. 
Yes, I totally understand this question. I think that's a part of future work that we want to do some sort of sensitivity analysis to really um, compare those. But at the moment, that's just a bit out of, um, well, it's a bit too much for the work that I'm currently doing. Yeah, you just have stolen my next question about sensitivity to ASF, but okay, let's look at questions by ours. Okay, again, bridge scientist Jason Dykes. A nice final statement. I think that's because we do it in our heads. So the question is, what are the advantages, disadvantages of making it explicit? So I think this question refers to um, doing this attribute scoring functions explicitly and not the filtering. And I believe that you can save a lot of time if you, for example, use a search engine to look for a new product, and then you can really type in your preferences and you don't have to filter and scroll through the whole list to find the perfect product as it just should show on top of the list and show your perfect match there. So that would be one of the main advantages. Thank you. When we have a question from Rostock, from Christian Teminskin. Uh, how is uh, this approach related to the concept of degree of interest? Um, I'm not familiar with the degree of interest, um, but I can just say that this approach with the attribute scoring functions helps the user to find interesting attributes at all, and on also to characterize the attribute values according to her preferences. So it does not just allow you to select attributes that interest you, but also values that interest you. Actually, you have a very interesting example of degree of interest and the value of interest in your paper uh, with uh, different thresholds, values uh, for, uh, I think, uh, engine uh, power uh, and uh, it, its relationship to taxation uh, uh, situations. Well, as there are no other questions from the audience, meanwhile, I will ask you another question. Uh, from my experience in multi-criteria decision analysis, often it happens that you make you have to make a decision based on multiple attributes, and some of these attributes are somehow related. For example, when you select an area, uh, a territory, uh, uh, possible attributes of interest are proportions of say female and male population and basically proportion of female is total minus proportion of male or if you deal with uh, two or three three or four age groups when one of age groups can be in, uh, deducted from uh, values of other age groups when you assign aasfs to such related attributes you need to somehow take into account this relationship between multiple attributes did you think about uh, uh, this? Yes, so there is, we plan to do something that shows a user correlation between attributes. And for example, if users define attribute scoring functions for several attributes that are strongly correlated, we definitely plan to show them a hint on that. And on the other hand, we also thought about multi-dimensional scoring functions where, for example, a user can specify his interest in fast cars for a certain brand and do some scoring for those. But again, that's also just a part of future work. Yeah, very interesting. interesting. It would be a very nice extension of your taxonomy for multi-dimensional ASF. I really would like to learn more about that. So please keep uh, the community updated about your great work. Thank you very much. And I think we now go ahead to the fourth and final presentation in this session. So now we go to Austria, to Vienna, and Wilma Weichselbaum and Krishimir Mark Matkovic will present their work on Rumble Flow plus plus interactive visual analysis of Dota 2 encounters. 
Hello, my name is Vilma. I'm a student at the Technical University of Vienna. Today I'm going to talk to you about a web-based tool I developed in order to visualize and explore Dota 2 encounters. First, I want to give you an introduction to Dota 2 and explain some basic terms before I tell you more about the application itself. Dota 2 is a video game, more specifically a MOBA. These games typically feature very strategic gameplay and are highly competitive. Similar to a board game, MOBAs are designed to take place in a limited space. There are two opposing teams, the Radiant and the Dyer, with five players each. Every player picks a character from a pool of 100 heroes. Naturally, the game is played online in real time. In order to ultimately win the game, a team has to destroy the base of the enemy team. The opposing teams will try to hinder each other by engaging in combat, resulting in several encounters throughout the game. And big encounters are called teamfights. These are encounters between the Radiant and the Dire team that involve the majority of heroes. Teamfights are an important aspect of a Dota 2 match, because both teams try to get the upper hand. They are also very stressful, as a lot of things happen all at once. And a teamfight might go either way, but the outcome usually has substantial impact on who wins the game. Players can use their hero's standard attack, their unique hero abilities, and their items throughout the fight to deal damage to enemy heroes or heal their allies. So we want to understand what went down during a teamfight and analyze the situations. For example, we might want to know if a hero was singled out during a teamfight and if everyone hit the right target. And to find that out, we usually want to look at the interactions during a fight. In order to analyze a team fight, players can rewatch the games by utilizing replays. Replays can be downloaded from Open Dota. Low level logs are another available resource based on atomic events. And for a couple seconds of team fights, we get several thousand events. And finally, there are also team fight summaries with high level aggregations. So let's take a look at a team fight summary. This is a third party team fight summary from Open Dota. We can say which players were involved in the fight, which died, the hero damage and hero healing that was dealt, the changes in gold and XP, abilities that were used, the items that were used, and on the minimap we can see the locations of the team fights um, as well as where the players died. All in all, the summary gives a nice overview of a team fight. We talk to several Dota 2 players and ask them which aspects are important to them when they analyze their team fights. They especially pay attention to what the players are doing. For example, when someone joined the fight, when someone abandoned the fight, who focused whom, if someone switched the target, who died and so on. Teamfight summaries can't answer these questions. We need more detail to answer them. Therefore, players will often watch their replays to find the answers. This can become a very tedious task. To give you an example, let's watch a couple seconds of an actual teamfight. So a lot happened during these 10 seconds. Let's try to unpack it. By looking at the events that happened during the fight, we can pin down who dealt damage or healing to whom, who used an ability or item, and who died. This is a screenshot from the fight we just watched. There are three types of units visible that are currently fighting. First, the heroes. Let's mark them with the corresponding icons. Secondly, this unit is a golem and was summoned by the hero Warlock. And lastly, these units are neutral creeps, which are not controlled by players. Since we are mostly interested in the interactions between players, we ignore neutral creeps for now. But the summoned unit's impact is of interest to us, because the damage that is dealt by the golem is brought about by Warlock. Therefore, we add any damage from the summoned unit to its summoner. In this frame, we see that Medusa deals damage per standard attack to Lifestealer and the neutral creeps. But they are not of interest to us. Tusk healed himself with an item. Warlock used an ability to summon his golem. And here we can see that a hero died. There are several more events happening here, but instead of picking them apart one by one, we created an application. And therefore we will have a brief look at the data behind it. We obtain the event data by passing the match replay. Replays can be downloaded from Open Dota. Events have a time at which the event took place, a type, 
damage, healing, ability, item or death, and an attacker who initiated the event. They can furthermore have a target that is infected by it. Damage events also have one of three damage types, magical, physical and pure. Damage types add complexity to the game. Damage and healing events also have a source, either standard attack, an ability or an item. And these events also have a value, the amount of health points that were taken away or given to the target. So the data that you see here translates to at this time in the game, the hero Lifestealer hits Medusa with the item Radiance for 17 points of magical damage. Based on this data, we created our application and visualizations. Now I will give you a short introduction to the Dota 2 Rumbleflow++. The application is split into three linked visualizations, which correspond to three different scopes. The match level, the teamfight level and the hero level. For the match level, we show the net worth and experience graph, which shows us when teamfights happened and which team won them. Secondly, on the level of a teamfight, we show a node link diagram that displays damage, healing and death events. Lastly, the cumulative damage curve is on the hero level and shows data from damage, ability and item events. Now let's view the visualizations in more detail. Net worth and experience are resources that the heroes can obtain during the match. They are correlated and the team with the higher value is in the lead. The net worth and experience graph is a well-known graph in the Dota 2 community and shows the disparity of net worth and experience values between the two teams over time. On the x-axis, time in minutes is shown. On the y-axis, the difference in experience and net worth of the two teams is shown. Climbing slopes indicate that the Radiant team gains momentum. Falling slopes indicate the Dire does. Roughly speaking, the graph shows which team currently has the upper hand. Though it is not a requirement, the team with the lead usually wins the game. Along the x-axis, there are teamfight indicators, which are color-coded according to the team that won the fight. Red swords mean Dyer won the fight, green swords mean Radiant won it. Yellow swords indicate the teamfight that is currently selected. By combining this concept with the net worth and experience graph, we can see what impact a teamfight had on the match. For example, this teamfight had considerable impact on the match. But the core of the application is the rumble flow. The rumble flow is first and foremost a node link diagram, which means our heroes are nodes and our interactions are links between the nodes. So visualizing an event like this one from before, Lifestealer hits Medusa with Radiance for 17 points of magical damage, would look like this. But the attacker and the target can also be the same hero, as you can see in this example. Medusa healed herself with the item Magic Wand for 165 points of health. In order to look at the progression of a fight, I included a timeline. A time frame can be selected by using the controls at the bottom. Currently, the skip and select static intervals of 1, 3 and 10 seconds. I also added a damage bar chart, so the busiest parts of a fight can easily be found, and these little skull symbols indicate that a hero died at this point in time. So, 3 seconds of the previous teamfight look like this. Warlock is somewhat focused by the Radiant team, but all these heroes exchange blows. Lifestealer also heals himself. I also included a filter, if you want to look at specific damage types or sources for example. But the most important aspects of the rumble flow are the node link diagram and the time dimension. Lastly, we added another visualization in order to answer hero level tasks, the cumulative damage curve. It shows the damage evolution based on the events of the selected hero, which in this case is the hero Lifestealer. Since it is cumulative, it holds valuable information in the slope. A steep slope indicates that high amounts of damage were dealt by the hero, while a gentle slope indicates that small amount was dealt. The slopes are always in relation to the total damage of the hero dealt in the fight, even so damage bursts can easily be spotted. Along the x-axis, ability and item usages are indicated. Uh, this helps in the understanding of damage bursts and their sources. It adds context to the cumulative damage curve as well as the rumble flow. We show items above the x-axis and abilities below, so it is easier to distinguish between the two sources. 
This is a brief demonstration of the Dota 2 Rumble Flow++. By selecting a mesh from the list, the three visualizations are filled with data. First, we want to take a look at the net worth and experience graph. We can see that there was not a significant disparity in net worth and experience between the two teams in the first 25 minutes. But after winning the fifth team fight, the Radiance lead rises significantly. Therefore, we want to further explore this team fight and select it. In the Rumble Flow, we see that Night Stalker opens up the fight by engaging Crystal Maiden. Crystal Maiden uses her item Glimmer Cape to escape. But then Lone Druid finds Morphling. Morphling is arguably the most important hero on the Dire team. Killing him is not only a priority for a Radiant, but it is also very valuable. Lone Druid also has the capability of trapping enemy heroes with his passive ability Entangle. So we take a look at his cumulative damage curve. In this case, Lone Druid entangled Morphling actually three times in a row, which we can see here in the source description. This keeps Morphling in place for quite some time, allowing Lone Druid to deal a lot of damage. After a while, Venomancer joins the fight, also engaging Morphling, as well as Night Stalker and Anti Mage. When we look at Morphling's cumulative damage curve, we see that he casts the ability Waveform. Waveform is an ability that deals damage to enemy heroes, but also allows him to reposition himself. So he can use this as an escape, but also to deal damage. This is what he does. This is what we can see here in these edges that go from Morphling to Anti-Mage and Lone Druid. After that, Morphling seems to be in a better position. But ultimately he can't get away from Night Stalker, and he can't get away from Lone Druid, and then Anti-Mage is on top of him again. After that, Team Radiant is able to kill Morphling. By defeating him early on, the greatest threat for the Radiant team was eliminated. After that, Dyer was at a great disadvantage, because Radiant was able to kill every single hero on the Dyer team. Let's have a quick look at the technologies that are used for implementation. I fetched the data from OpenDOTA and Liquipedia and processed matches with the Clarity Replay parser to extract the interactions. For the backend, I used a Postgre database, which is supported by Django, which is the web framework that I used. I structured the frontend with React and created the visualizations with D3. I used D3 because it is very flexible and offers high customizability. It also supports force fields, which help to arrange the nodes initially, but nodes can be dragged around as well. To evaluate the rumble flow, we conducted interviews within the scope of a short user study with five participants. So the visualizations are made for Dota 2 players, therefore all participants had played the game before, but the degree of expertise varied. Generally, when analyzing a team fight, the participants want to know what the players are doing, when someone joined or abandoned the fight, who focused whom, but also about positioning, etc. We showed them an open Dota teamfight summary and asked them, from the information that is shown, what are the heroes with the highest impact on this particular teamfight? And the answer was clear. It was Husker. He has the highest amount of hero damage and the highest amount of hero healing done. Night Stalker and Lone Druid also had high impact. Now we look at the same team fight, but we use the Rumble Flow. Just by looking at the nodes and links, every participant found out that Husker dealt all the damage to himself, healing as well. In fact, Husker did not even participate in this team fight. All five participants stated that the summary was misleading because the hero's actions were not related to the actual fight. Even more so, he did not even partake but was perceived as having had the most impact on the team fight. So we found out that summary aggregates are sometimes misleading. Aside from that, the rubble flow provides a lot of information in addition to a summary. And being able to explore the fight bit by bit and see the flow of interactions between the nodes was very well received. The skulls along the timeline greatly helped with orientation, while the bar chart was perceived as nice, but not of great importance, because the users got the damage information already from the node link view. 
They felt the same way about the filter, which was used by only two out of five participants during the study. So it's nice, but not very important. Based on the feedback from the user study, we received suggestions to further improve the rumble flow. While some were content with the time controls, others said that they could be more dynamic when selecting timeframes. Visually marking heroes that are currently dead in the node link diagram was also often mentioned. One participant also suggested to include the damage type information into the link, which is more practical than the filter. Lastly, the two additions that were mentioned by almost everyone are detailed information on ability and item usages in the rumble flow and information on the positioning of the heroes. But to bring the rumble flow plus plus to the next level, our future work includes teamfight analysis by adding decision assessments and suggestions by utilizing machine and deep learning. And that just about covers it. Thanks for watching. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk and very well presented. Immediate question directly you. to you. Do you play uh, Dota 2 yourself? Yes, I do, casually, so. Because <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't play uh, such kind of games and before it's, it's hard for me to understand uh, what the main, but it, uh, what is very interesting to me is to, um, uh, to see if uh, this I your ideas can be applied to different kinds of, kinds of games uh, or even very different kinds of application domains. And while you were presenting, there was an uh, intensive discussion uh, uh, in YouTube and uh, in uh, social media about applicability uh, of these ideas to uh, impact of reviews on improvement papers uh, uh, <laughs> or there, there was also a question from Lars Noneman uh, uh, about how complex it is to adapt your visualization tool to other kinds of uh, games. Um, the visualization itself would be quite adaptable, I think. Uh, for example, uh, League of Legends comes to mind for a uh, different MOBA. Um, the problem might be the event data behind it, because for Dota 2, or for example, for CSGO, um, you can get the data from uh, APIs. I don't know how this is for League of Legends, because that's uh, a different game. It's from a different um, uh, di different people made, made the game. So there is probably um, a different provider for, for the data. So you'd, you'd have to look into that. But that's only the back end. Um, for the front end, um, you basically have the same concept and it does not um, have to be limited to MOBAs. It could also be implemented for first person shooters. So you have an, an interaction between, um, between the anime team, for example, it's the same principle. Personally, I'm more interested in other kinds of games that are playing on TV every evening uh, nowadays. Uh, I mean, soccer and other sports. And I wonder mm -hmm. if uh, you can apply similar ideas to uh, football. And while I was telling this, I think so. Natalia I think asked so, yeah. a question about this as well. Uh, is it possible to apply the system to transfers between football teams? Ooh, well, if you, I think so. It's all about all about the data. If the data um, is there in the same uh, granularity, for example, um, you could do it. I yeah, think so, at least. <laughs> Formally speaking, yes, and looking just as, as, as a straightforward application. But if you think a little bit deeper, when uh, you know, in the football, they have different stages of the game. Defense, mm -hmm. uh, counter-attack, uh, transition periods, uh, uh, things happen yeah, yeah. in different parts mm -hmm. of the pitch. So this means that you need to be able to identify different contextual situations. Yeah, you need sure. to there, understand there are tactics unique requirements. In these, uh, uh, yeah. uh, similar tactical situations. Yeah. Do you have so, a, any ideas of how identification of contextual uh, situations can be applied uh, in your uh, settings? Um, I'm not sure how detailed you mean, because uh, the Dota 2 Rumble Flow++ plus plus is um, obviously um, quite tailored to the game um, and, and the requirements of, of Dota. Mm -hmm. So it would be easy to transfer 
uh, the concept to a different game of the same kind, but um, transferring it to, for example, football, soccer, um, or um, other regular sports, for example, there are unique requirements to consider. So that would be, I think you could reuse the concept, but um, in reality, you'd have to to do a lot of work to make it suitable or usable for, for the actual users. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and returning back to uh, your particular Dota 2 game, there is a question from uh, uh, Michel uh, Berish. What's about overall strategy? Could, uh, could you use your tool to learn about team strategy? Is it the same or different between multiple games, multiple matches? Oh, well, that's interesting and that's that also tips into future work because um, we all actually plan to to do a more detailed uh, team fight analysis uh, with machine learning. So we can, for example, compare the decisions, are, which de uh, decisions are good decisions, which are bad decisions, and have them compare between different team fights and matches. So it's hard to say right now um, what the... Uh, for, for a strategy, um, uh, for answering strategy. But it's it's useful if you um, take a look at the team fight so you can explore uh, the different actions. Um, but you can't really draw a complete, um, a, a complete strategy from it. For example, you can't analyze a team strategy for, for fighting a particular set of enemy heroes or something like that. But that would be um, interesting for future work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of course. Yeah, and Michelle has a follow-up question. Would you uh, say what, uh, what there is one metric or feature that determines success? Probably um, we no. need to get back to the previous <laughs> talk about attribute scoring functions and think um, about... There is, there is not one, but many, many, many um, metrics. There are some you can uh, probably orient yourself um, but there are many, many factors that, that come into play. So um, I mentioned the experience and the net worth uh, metrics because they are very common. Everybody knows what they, uh, what they mean in, in the Dota 2 community, but they are not um, reliable. So uh, I mean, they are reliable in some sort, but of course, if you have a huge lead, it doesn't automatically mean you win the game. There are comeback mechanics and so on. So it's it's really hard to say. And only having a lead in experience and net worth does not mean that you're winning the game. There are other factors, positioning, um, itemization, communication is a very big one between teammates, of course. So it's hard to pin down only one or two metrics. There are a lot. And there is another question from someone with nickname Typhoon21. Uh, is this hosted somewhere publicly? Maybe it's one of the players. <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> but um, some people already approached me uh, that they would like to use the tool for for personal uh, purposes. For example, there are often discussions between team members, um, kind of um, trying to figure out who made mistakes. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. Um, Sadly, uh, it's not hosted yet, but might be in the future. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as there are no other questions, I just wish you success in continuing uh, your work. Please pass my greetings to Krishimir. Thank and, you very much. We'll do uh, let's uh, proceed to closing the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. It was a great pleasure for me to chair this very interesting session. I enjoyed all four talks and discussion with authors afterwards. Now I'm standing between you and lunch, therefore I am going to close the session and looking forward to meet you again in the next session afternoon. Goodbye.